I love a good courtroom drama. So like I'm watching a television show, I want to watch like Law and Order, something like that. When I'm reading fiction, uh, it's usually going to be either crime or courtroom or something like that. Uh, one of my favorite episodes of The Brady Bunch when I was growing up, you guys remember The Brady Bunch? One of my favorite episodes of The Brady Bunch was when Mrs. Brady had to go to court. She got into a little fender bender in a parking lot, and the guy that she hit decided to sue her because he had gone through such great pain and suffering. And so they're going through the whole court case, and it looks really bad for Mrs. Brady. Uh, and then right as the case is about to decide, Mr. Brady stands up, and he grabs his briefcase, and he throws it across the courtroom. And everyone's shocked because you can't do that in a courtroom. But as it makes this big, loud, thumping noise when it hits the floor, uh, the guy that Mrs. Brady had hurt swings his head around and moves his neck. And everybody says, aha, he wasn't really hurt. It was this great moment. Right? What makes a good courtroom drama is the big reveal at the end. Right? There's always this big reveal of, aha, and here's the truth that you needed to know. Maybe... Maybe the best courtroom movie ever made is A Few Good Men. Uh, some of you guys remember that. If you're my age, you probably remember that. It was a couple of decades ago now. Um, but, but I love this movie, and this movie also has a big reveal at the end. We discover that Colonel Jessup did indeed order the code red. Now, we, we kind of thought he did through the whole movie, but it gets confirmed at the end that that's the truth, and we're all like, well, I could handle that truth, right? I, I, I can do that. Romans is kind of like a courtroom drama. Uh, it, Paul, in, in Romans 1 through 11 especially, is acting almost like a prosecuting attorney, just building his case and building his case, moving towards the big reveal at the end. But he gives us a hint at what that's going to be at the beginning. Remember two weeks ago, uh, we looked at Romans 1, 16 and 17. And right there, Paul lets us know what the big reveal is going to be. The big reveal is the righteousness of God. Remember what he said? In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And so now from Romans 1 all the way through Romans 11, Paul is going to be building up to that, and he gets to Romans 11, and it's this fantastic chapter that ends with Paul almost bursting into song. He says, oh, for the, the, the riches of God's wisdom and glory, his magnificence for to him and through him and for him are all honor. It's this really great passage. It's all about the righteousness of God being revealed. But then the verse after that in chapter 1, we saw last week, tells us that first, God's wrath is going to be revealed. Remember, we saw this last week, that God's wrath is revealed against all of humanity because we have abandoned him. We have chosen not to worship him. We have rejected him and chosen instead to worship ourselves and, and to worship creation. And so God's wrath is being revealed against humanity because of that. Here, here's a quick summary of Romans chapter 1. Humanity has earned God's wrath. Right? Because we haven't worshiped him. We've abandoned him. And humanity cannot earn God's righteousness. No matter what we do, we can't measure up to him. Because we've fallen short, because we make mistakes, because we mess up, God's righteousness is far above ours. And so God is always right. And where we contradict God, we are wrong. And now as we move into chapter 2, what chapter 2 begins to teach us is that humanity has created a religion to try. So, so humanity cannot earn the righteousness of God, but we create religion to try. You see, all religions are an attempt to earn the favor of God. Now, not all religions believe in the same God, but all religions essentially answer three questions. And, and this has been true for all of history. So any religion anywhere, anytime, has tried to answer these three questions. Number one, who made all this? Right? Where did all this come from? Who made this? Number two, what is he like? What's that, what's that God like? And number three, how can I please him? Those are the three big questions of every religion because the idea is that whoever or whatever the creator is, that is the ultimate power. And that is the power to whom I am accountable and responsible. And so if that power is angry at me or wrathful at me, I want to know how to please that power. And so every religion of all time has tried to answer these three questions. But here's the problem. And this is what Paul is going to teach us today. Religion always fails us. Religion always fails us because none of us 
can live up to our own religion. It doesn't matter what your religion is. It doesn't matter when in history you've had a religion. Every religion has the same. It's a list of here's what you should do in order to please the deity that we believe in. But the reality is nobody can ever live up to their own religion because religion fails us. And alongside that, none of us can live up to our own conscience. We, We all know internally that there are times when we don't measure up. There are times when we mess up, when we fall short. And so religion fails us. This is, this is Paul's main point in Romans chapter 2. Let's pick it up in verse 12. He says, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Can you guess what the key word in this verse is? Like in second service, they just yelled it out. They were confident. You guys aren't so confident, are you? Yeah, you guys know it. It's law. That's right. It's law. Because it shows up four times. Anytime you see the same word four times in a verse, you should probably pay attention to it. Now, generally speaking, law is that list of rules that we create to please the deity that we believe in. All right? So no matter what your religion is, that religion has a law. It can be a list of four things you have to do or eight things you have to do or a hundred things you have to do or 600 things you have to do, whatever it might be. These are all of the things you have to do in order to please the deity that you belong to, believe in. Uh, Another way to think of it might be, how would you answer the question, what makes God happy? Right? What makes God happy? And however you answer that question, that's your law. So, So if I say to you, what is it that you do to make God happy? Or what is it that you do to please God? Or what is it that you do to earn your way into heaven? Well, however you answer that question, that's your law. If I say, how are you going to get into heaven? And you say, well, I read my Bible every day, then that's your law. If I say, you know, how are you going to please God? And you say, I pray three times a day, then that's your law. If I say, what do you think, God, what do you think makes God happy? And you say, I go to the gathering every Sunday. Sometimes I go twice then that's your law, right? The law is anything that we do. Like we make our list of things that we do to please God, to earn righteousness, to earn our way into heaven. Now, specifically here, Paul is talking about the law of Moses because that's another list, right? So for many of the Jewish people, they believe that was their list that, that would please God. And that's the law he's talking about here. The reason is because he's trying to create two categories of people. He's creating a category of people who have the law, that's the Jewish people, and a category of people who do not have the law, that's the Gentiles. And what does he say? He said, the people who do not have the law, that's the Gentiles, those who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. It's really simple what he's saying here. See, it doesn't matter if you're Jewish. It doesn't matter if you're a Gentile. If you sinned, you're going to be judged for it whether you have the law or not. Now, he's going to clarify it a little bit more in the next verse. He says, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. So he's saying, look, the, the, the Jewish people, they've got the law. They've all heard the law. But that's not enough. Just having possession of the law, listening to the law, reading the law, that's not enough. He says the only way to be righteous, now, now pay close attention here, The only way to be righteous, the only way to be justified in the eyes of God is to do the law. Now, some of you are like, wait, David, I I thought we didn't believe that. No, we don't, but we kind of do. All right, so stay with me. To do the law, according to Paul, does not mean try to do the law, right? Like Yoda said, there is no try, only do or do not. So if you try and do not, did you? No, you did not. And that's what he's saying. Look, you try to do the law and you missed and you did not do the law, you don't count. So James says this in James chapter 2. He says, if anyone keep the law, the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So you can keep the whole law for your whole life, but mess up once. Did you do the law? No, you didn't do the law. Because that's not enough. See, this, this, is, this is why the law can't save us, is because we can't do the law. But one person did, Right? Jesus. Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly. From conception to ascension, Jesus fulfilled the law. He was 
perfect righteousness. And, and get this, this is the best part. Jesus fulfilling the law goes beyond just obeying the law. He fulfilled all righteousness for all people. That means us too. You see, when Jesus went to the cross, God took all of our sins, all the times we mess up, and he credited those to Jesus' account. And so Jesus died for all of our sins. And in doing that, he fulfilled the law for everyone. So if I want to receive what Jesus earned, I have to somehow have God transfer that from Jesus' account to my account. This is where Paul is going with this, all right? And so Paul says the only way to be righteous, the only way to be justified is to be like Jesus. You see, here's the thing. Only Jesus meets the standard, so only Jesus sets the standard. Picnic is coming up in a couple weeks, right? And I know a lot of you guys are planning to bring great side dishes. You know, they always say, hey, we need lots of side dishes, so salads, pasta salad, yada, yada, yada. People bring dessert. <laughs> okay? It's one, it's one day out of the year. Let's just eat meat and eat dessert. Let's just skip the veggies, okay? I mean, you do what you want. But imagine, imagine that I decide I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to bring a side dish this year, and I'm going to bring my world-famous side dish that is absolutely amazing. You've never had anything like it. I like to call it my peanut butter egg salad with tangerine. <laughs> Does that sound delicious? Right? And it, it looks as good as it sounds. And, you know, you hear about this, and you're like, man, I hear Pastor David. He's going to have his, his peanut butter egg salad with tangerine. I want to try that. So you show up for the church picnic, and you go out here in the lobby where all the tables are, and I'm actually standing next to my dish. And you walk up to me, and you say, is this it? Is this the peanut butter egg salad with tangerine? I'm like, it is. And you look in it, and it looks disgusting. Just imagine what that might look like, right? You got the egg all mashed up and the tangerines kind of splattered as juices everywhere and there's seeds here and there from the tangerine. And then you got the peanut butter all kind of mixed in that ugly brown. So it kind of looks disgusting, but you're like, I will try it. And so you take one bite, one. <laughs> and you say to me, David, that is the most disgusting thing I have ever eaten in my life. All of the mouthwash in the world is not going to be enough to get the taste out of my mouth. That is absolutely horrible. It's awful. You should get rid of it and never bring it back out in public. And I say to you, what well, would you like the recipe? And you say, no, thank you. You see, my, my dish didn't meet your standard, and so you don't care what my standard is. Now, if you have another dessert, like let's say, I mean, there's like, Last year, like eight Swiss cake roll desserts, which was awesome, people. Well done. You eat one of those, and you're like, this is the most amazing thing I have ever eaten. Where do I get the recipe? Right? Because if it meets the standard, then that's the standard you want to follow. This is Jesus. Jesus is the only one who has ever been righteous. He is the only one who has been right in the eyes of God. And so he is the standard. Which means when we get to the final judgment, it's not how good did I do, it's do I measure up to Jesus? And if I don't measure up to Jesus, I fall short. That's what Paul is saying here. Now, this raises a tough question, right? This raises a difficult question. The question is, will God really judge those who have never heard of Jesus? You've probably thought about this question. You've probably contemplated it. You might have asked it. You've had people ask you this question. And, and let's just be honest. Let's acknowledge right up front that the answer to this question is a little bit uncomfortable. Okay? And, and maybe even borderline offensive for some. But let me remind you that how truth makes you feel is less important than what the truth motivates you to do. Let me say that again. How the truth makes you feel, because how you feel doesn't change the truth. So how the truth makes you feel is less important than what the truth motivates you to do. And I'm going to be honest with you. The truth regarding this question will not make you feel good. Okay, let's, 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 look, let's see what Paul had to say. Verse 14. For when Gentiles who do not have the law, right? So Moses gave the law to the Jewish people, but not to the Gentiles. So they don't have Moses' law. 
when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires. So, so sometimes, even though the Gentiles don't have the law, they still obey the law. Right? The law says, thou shalt not kill. A lot of Gentiles think that killing is wrong. The law says, thou shalt not steal. A lot of Gentiles think stealing is wrong. Do you see how this works? And what Paul says is they do this how? By nature. It's, it's innate within them. It's just understood that much of the law makes sense. Now, now watch what he says. So when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. So they, they've got their own law now, right? It, it's their internal law. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness. Paul is making an argument here that all of humanity has the law written on their hearts. We know right from wrong. We have a conscience that tells us when we're doing right and when we're doing wrong. And, and the fact that most civilizations and most cultures in the history of the world have the pretty much the same standard of right and wrong, don't kill, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, right? That's because it's written on our hearts, because it's natural. So, so Paul says, look, it's written on your hearts. It's what your conscience says. He keeps going here, right? Well, their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So what he's saying is, is everybody's conflicted about themselves. You are, I am, we all are, right? There are times I think I'm a good person and there are times I think I'm a bad person, right? Because I know that sometimes I do good things and sometimes I do bad things. And so my inner nature, my conscience, sometimes accuses me and sometimes excuses me. But here's Paul's point. If your conscience can accuse you and excuse you, then that's evidence that you know right from wrong and you sometimes choose to do wrong. And every person who has ever lived on the face of the earth knows right from wrong and has chosen to do wrong. And therefore, says Paul, they will stand judgment. That's what he says. That's how he finishes, right? He says, on that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Who's the standard? Jesus. Jesus. Everyone will be judged by the standard of Jesus because everyone has a conscience. Everyone knows right from wrong. And if you knowingly violate your conscience, then you are guilty. Now, I, I get it. This doesn't feel good, right? This is a tough truth. It's not one we want to hear, but remember what I said. How the truth makes me feel is less important than what the truth motivates me to do. So here's my question. Is, is, is this a truth you're just going to sit there and say, I don't like that? Are you going to say, ah, this is offensive to me? Or are you going to do something about it? Right? What does this truth motivate you to do? To get mad at God for being just, for being righteous? Or to say, I need to tell people about Jesus. Because there are people in this world who will live their whole lives and never hear the truth about Jesus. I need to help them know. This is one of the reasons I get behind Operation Christmas Child, right? I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. The shoebox thing, that's great. You know, let's, let's ship stuff to people all over the world. That's, that's fine. Do you know why I really like it? Because with the shoeboxes goes the gospel. That every time a child receives a shoebox, they hear the truth about Jesus. And that means that's one more person who will not live without the truth about Jesus. That's why our church gets behind Operation Christmas Child, because we take this seriously. We know this is a hard truth. It doesn't feel good. We don't like it, but we're going to do something about it. And we want to do everything that we can as a church to connect more people with Jesus so that more people will know him and will escape that final judgment. Paul says, look, religion always fails us. Religion always fails us because we always fall short even of our own conscience. And whatever law that you cook up for yourself, you're going to fall short of it. And that makes you guilty. But having kind of convicted the Gentiles now, he's going to turn and talk to the Jewish people. 
Because in, in Rome, there was a real mix of people. There were a lot of Jewish people, a lot of Gentiles. And so as they were reading this, maybe for the first time, some of the Jewish people were probably just kind of nodding their heads, saying, yep, those Gentiles are going to get it. And it's going to be right. Good job, God. Go get them. And then Paul says, but if you call yourself a Jew. So now he's going to change directions. Now, as we read this next section, I want you to think of yourself as a Jewish person. I know you're probably not, but that's okay. In, in this context, in, in Rome 2,000 years ago, it was the Jewish people who had the privilege and the benefits and the blessings of having a history with the right religion, right? They were the ones who had known God for the longest. They had the revelation of God. And so they had all the privileges, all the benefits, all the blessings of that history. Now, 2,000 years later, who is it that has the privileges and the benefits and the blessings of the historically correct religion? It's us, the Christians, right? Because when Jesus came, he set this up. We, we can follow our line all the way back to him. And so we are very much like the Jewish people that Paul was writing to. And as I read this section, I think you're going to see that maybe not very much, maybe exactly like. He says, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law, just like we rely on God's word, the Bible, and boast in God. We, we believe that our understanding of God is accurate, that, that the God that we worship, the God of the Bible, that is the one true God. And it's easy to be prideful about that, to boast in that, and know his will and approve what is excellent. We do believe that, that we know what God's plan for humanity is because you are instructed from the law. Because again, our, our source of authority is God's word. It's the Bible. You, you can see how everything Paul is saying to the Jewish people can also be applied to us. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, right? That's us. We want to we help those who are spiritually blind see the truth. A light to those who are in darkness. Yes, that's us. We want to brighten the world of everyone around us. You know, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Don't hide your light under a bushel. That, that's us. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children. Yes, we want to pass the faith on to every generation. We want every child to, to grow up to know Jesus, to love Jesus, and follow Jesus for their whole life. This is us, right? He, he's talking to us here. Having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, just as we have in Jesus the embodiment of knowledge and truth. Now, now get this. These are all good things. Remember what I said? These are, these are benefits these are privileges. They are blessings that we have been given, and that is awesome. But if all that applies to us, then what comes next applies to us also. Verse 21, you then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You say that one must not commit adultery. Do you, do you commit adultery? Remember in the Sermon on the Mount how Jesus clarified some of these laws, right? He said it's not just about what you do. It's not just about your external actions. It's also about your heart. It's about your motivation. It's about your intentions. It's about your attitude. That's what Paul is hinting at here. You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles, because of you. That's a quote from the Old Testament that appears many times in the Old Testament. The prophets would all often say to Israel, because of your behavior, the surrounding nations are blaspheming God. And while it may not always be fair, and it may not always be deserved, let's be honest, there are times when we have earned it, we do deserve it, it is fair that God's people cause others to curse God's name. You probably know people who say, the reason I won't ever follow God is because of Christians. You see, the reality is all of the benefits and all of the blessings, all of the privilege that we have in, in having the Bible, having been exposed to the Bible, being teachers of the Bible, being the light of the world, being guides of the mind, all of that is good, but none of that makes us righteous. Because we don't hold to the whole law. You see, if you ever practice differently than you preach, then your religion has failed you. Because if you can't live up to everything on your checklist, then you've fallen short. Remember, Jesus is the standard. Perfection. 
sinlessness, complete righteousness. And so whatever your checklist is to earn righteousness, if you don't keep it perfectly, then you fall short. We have a word for this, don't we? Hypocrite. And, and, and some have said, and you've probably heard it, the church is full of hypocrites. And I tend to agree. We're all hypocrites. Because all of us at some point in our life practice differently than I preach, right? I, I, I do. You know, I don't always live up to everything I say. I don't always live up to everything that I say I believe. And, and so I'm, I'm a hypocrite. And, and I think the church is full of hypocrites. But here's the really good news. Heaven will be full of forgiven hypocrites. Because God's righteousness never fails, right? Religion always fails us. We will always fall short if we try to earn our own righteousness. But God's righteousness never fails us. Now, now here at the end of chapter 2, Paul's going to give us a hint of what's coming. And, and as we get later into the book, especially chapters 7 and 8, 8 is awesome, when we get there, it's going to be amazing. We're going to see how God's righteousness never fails us, okay? But, but today, it's just a little bit of a hint. It's a little bit of a taste at what's coming here at the end of chapter 2. This is what Paul writes. He says, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. All right, here's, here's, here's what Paul is saying. There are many people who are born Jewish, who are a part of national Israel. And, and when we get to chapters 9 through 11 of Romans, Paul's really going to unpack this for us, all right? But we're going to say, look, there are many people who are born Jewish, but they are a part of national Israel, but they are not a part of what you might call spiritual Israel or covenantal Israel. They do not have the righteousness of God because their Jewishness, Paul says, is all external but not internal. Now, he uses circumcision as an example because circumcision is the, the physical sign of the covenant with God. You are connected with God. It's a physical sign. But what Paul is saying is that outward sign, that external sign is meaningless if it doesn't reflect something that's happened internally. You know, we have a similar sign, right? For us, it's baptism. Baptism is an external sign. And baptism is beautiful and it's amazing. And if you haven't been baptized and you're a follower of Jesus, you should get baptized, sign up now on the Church Center app. But if that external, if that outward expression doesn't represent an internal change that has already happened, it's meaningless. That's what Paul is saying. Right? He said, look, righteousness doesn't come from what we do. It comes from what Jesus has already done for us. Righteousness is not something that we can earn externally. It's something that we receive internally. How? He says right here, through the Spirit, not through the letter. What is the letter? The letter is the law. It's the list of what I do. All the things that I do, that's not enough. So, so make it really simple. If I say to you, when you get to heaven and God asks you why he should let you in, what will you say? Well, you know, I, I read the Bible most of the time. I, I, I had the version app and I, I followed along. I only fell asleep in church, you know, once a month or so. Um, I helped little old ladies across the street. I brought Swiss cake rolls to Pastor David. I, I did a lot of good things. Do I need to keep going? And God will say, and how does all of that measure up to Jesus? And, and, and do you see how quickly all of your goodness is like filthy rags? That's what Isaiah said. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And the reason, the reason is because God doesn't look at our actions. Back in, in 1 Samuel, uh, the prophet Samuel is going to announce, uh, anoint the next king of Israel. And he goes to Bethlehem and he finds this guy named Jesse and he gets Jesse's sons lined up and he looks at the first one and he says, this, this has got to be the next king of Israel. I mean, he, he's tall, he's strong, he's, he's handsome, he's got the riz. That's what the kids say for charisma. <laughs> All right. So I, like, they're, they're too lazy to actually say charisma. So it's like the riz, but he's got the riz. And God says to Samuel, 
No, he's not the one. And God says, Samuel, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Right? All that stuff that you think is your, your righteousness, that's all external, and it doesn't mean anything to God. God wants to know if your heart is right. Let me, let me, let me take a quick second, because I, I want to make a really important distinction here for us, okay? And this is kind of like an, an aside. It's like a footnote, so like put a little one, and then let's go down to the bottom of the page. And here, here's the footnote. I'm not saying we shouldn't do good things. We should do good things, right? We, we should try to live righteous lives, but that's not going to save us. It's like this. God will not choose me because I do good things. But because God chose me, I should do good things. Imagine, imagine that as we finish up here today, somebody comes up and says, hey, David, uh, Joe Burrow is outside. Do you think you'd like to play football with Joe Burrow? Like, yeah. Like, but I'm a pretty good receiver. I'm, I'm, I'm like super fast. I've got great hands. I can jump. I run precise routes. Man, he's going to love playing with me. And you look at me and you say, David, you are a 50-year-old short fat man. <laughs> Joe Burrow is not going to love playing with you. Doesn't matter how much good I can do, I'm not good enough to play football with Joe Burrow. But if Joe Burrow says, I pick David, I want him on my team. How hard am I going to work for Joe Burrow? Oh, I'm going to work hard because he's awesome. There's nothing you can do that will make God pick you. But because he's picked you, how hard are you going to work for his team? Look what Paul says here at the end. He says, his praise is not from man, but from God. So look, God, God looks at things differently than humans do. And if you're working, if you're working so that humans will like you, so that humans will approve you, so that humans will think you're righteous, even if it's your own righteousness, that's not going to do it. That's not going to earn the praise of God. Because look, you cannot receive the praise of God while you are working for the praise of people. It doesn't work that way. If you're working for the praise of people, then God will not praise you. And if you're working for the praise of God, then people will probably not praise you. You have to choose. So whose praise do you want? Now, let's finish with this really important question. How, how do I receive the praise of God? How do I receive the approval of God? How do I receive the righteousness of God? Let me make it really simple. Give your heart to Jesus. That's it. Give your heart to Jesus. And when I say your heart, I'm not talking about the, you know, the, the organ that pumps blood through your whole body. I'm talking about you, your, your person, who, it is, who you are inside, your priorities, your values, your, your motives, your attitudes. Give that to Jesus. And giving that to Jesus really looks like, it's, it's kind of like two steps. This is what Jesus said in Mark. He said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. So it's repent and then it's believe, okay? So to repent means simply to say, I've been wrong. I need to change. I, I've been looking to my own righteousness. I've been trying to do this on my own. I've been counting on myself. I've been working through religion. That hasn't worked. I'm repenting. I was wrong. And to believe says, I believe that Jesus has actually done what I needed to do. Jesus has actually done what I couldn't do. Jesus has actually earned righteousness for me. And so starting now, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. I'm going to give him my priorities. I'm going to give him my values. I'm going to give him my attitudes. I'm going to give him my life because he has earned for me what I could not earn for myself. Give your heart to Jesus. Let me clarify with number two. Give your whole heart to Jesus. Don't hold anything back. Sometimes we like to give most of our heart to Jesus but there's a few things we kind of hold back for ourselves, right? Like, I, okay, I'm going to give Jesus my heart, but I'm going to stay in this relationship, even though I know it doesn't honor him. I'm, I'm going to give my heart to Jesus, but I'm going to hold on to my money because I, I want it. I'm going to give my heart to Jesus, but I, I'm still going to pursue my own reputation. You see, I'm going to give most of me to Jesus, but not all of me. Give your whole heart to Jesus. And here's the third thing to clarify this even a little bit more. 
Give your heart to nothing but Jesus. Stop, stop giving your heart to the things that you think will make you happy. Stop giving your heart to the things that make you comfortable or safe or provide a secure future for yourself. Stop giving your heart to all these things that the world says matter. Stop giving your heart to the things that you think make you look good. Give your whole heart to Jesus and nothing but Jesus. I, I know many of you have done this, but maybe number two and three kind of hit home today and and for you, your next step is to say, okay, maybe there is a, a door in my life that I've had closed to him. And I, I've said, Jesus, come into my life, but don't go in that room. And I need to open that door to him. Maybe there's something that I've been chasing with my heart that, that doesn't lead me towards God, but is leading me away from him. And I need to make some changes there. But I'm asking for sure that there's somebody in here this morning who's never given their heart to Jesus. Or there's somebody watching online that has never given their heart to Jesus. And if that's you, today is the day. Whatever you've been doing to try to earn righteousness, it's not working. Whatever you've been doing to earn the favor of God, it will not work. Only Jesus is righteous. You need his righteousness. And so today I want to urge you, give your heart to him. Here's a simple prayer that you can pray. There's nothing special in these words. It's the thoughts that matter. Today I'm starting over. I believe that Jesus died and rose again for me. I repent of my sins and receive your forgiveness. I give my heart and my life to you. You are my Lord and my God. If these words align with your heart and you can speak them to God, then he will take the righteousness of Jesus and he will apply it to your account. And he will no longer see you as someone who is sinful or flawed or fallen short. He will see you as he sees Jesus, righteous. And he will adopt you and make you his own. This is the best news we could ever hear. And we need to remind ourselves of this on a regular basis. That's, that's why every month we come back to this table, to remind ourselves that Jesus did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And so this morning, I want to invite you to celebrate, to remember communion with us. Just a moment, I'm going to pray, and then after I pray, the band will come.